Uh, Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, Lord, we come before you, and uh, Lord, I know that there are some in our midst who are celebrating, and there are some who are grieving, Father. There are some who have had one of the best weeks of the year, and some who've had one of the worst. Some who are in a pleasant season, and some who the pressures of life and this world and the things that they are going through right now are crushing them. So, Father, we know that you speak to us, and Father can use us. Lord, we know that you can do a work in and through us in all seasons of life. And so, Lord, wherever we are and whatever we've been through, I just pray, Lord, that you would just help us to see you in all of it. I told the first service as I was reflecting this morning, in the book of Zephaniah, Lord, those first few chapters are just filled with so much despair, discouragement, suffering. And then there near the end of the book in chapter 3, we get the encouraging words from you. Father, there you come and say, the Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior who saves. And he will take great delight in you. Father, remind us of our value and our worth to you. Remind us of your great love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Somebody asked me last week, we started this new series called The Questions Jesus Asks. And somebody asked me last week after the first service, they said, I've always wondered why preachers don't do this series more. I mean, it seems like such an obvious series. Jesus asks a bunch of questions, and they're good questions, and they're questions we should all consider. And I've just always wondered why, why I don't hear that series more. And, and listen, I'm not the first person to preach this series. There are plenty of people who've done this before. But I was thinking about it, and it's really not a super common kind of theme or series that people do, and, and I, I think I know the answer as to why. Um, I'll give you the, my answer to that question. The reason more people don't talk about this or preach about this is because the questions Jesus asks are hard. <laughs> They're uncomfortable. And, and people don't like to be uncomfortable or confronted with hard things. And so uh, we tend to like to preach John 3.16 and Romans 10, 9, and you know, some of, some of those kinds of things today, people gravitate towards that because the questions Jesus asks are hard. And so my prayer for you is, is this, I, I, you know, I pray that, that you would not be scared off by these questions. I pray that you wouldn't be um, so convicted by these questions that you would, you know, want to repel them or not consider them. I, I pray that even if they convict your heart and your life, that you would take time to consider their worth and their value to, to, to your life. If Jesus asks a question, you probably ought to pay attention to it. Today's question is a why question. And you know, when you ask somebody a why question, you never know what answer you're going to get. You might not get the answer you expect to get. I'm going to tell you a little story about one of my children. I won't tell you which one of the four it was, but I will tell you this. This particular child um, had a problem as a youth. As a youth, I shouldn't even say as a youth, as a, as a toddler, he had a problem. Uh, early on, we noticed that uh, he was a biter. Do we have any fellow biters in the room? Were you a biter when you were a kid? We had one person brave enough to admit it in the first service. A couple of you raising your hands this morning. So he was a biter, and uh, he, he was known for that. That's what he was known for at a, an early age. On one of these occasions that he, he bit a child, I got the, the call from the daycare to come pick him up. And can I just tell you, it's infuriating when your kid is the one who gets bit. How many of you, your kid was ever bit by another kid? Me too. I've been on both sides of this, okay? Um, So I know what it feels like to be on the other side of that. Like, it's infuriating when your kid is the one that gets bitten by another kid. I've been on that side. 
And I can tell you from being on the other side, when your kid is the one doing the biting, it's embarrassing. Because they call you, and they don't just tell you to come pick your kid up and you go pick them up. No, they sit you down in the office. So I, I went to pick this child up from the daycare, and I was already frustrated and mad because this wasn't his first offense. And I went in there with my tail between my legs, and the child care worker sat me down and gave me the lecture, the standard lecture. If you own a biter yourself, you've had the lecture. You know, if they keep doing this, they can't come back here, and, you know, why can't you control your kid and all that kind of stuff. And so on the ride home, I, I asked my precious little carnivore, <laughs> why did you bite that other kid. And I'm, I'm looking at him. I'm doing the thing through the rear view mirror, you know. Kids in the back. And he said, I don't know, Daddy. And I said, no, I don't know is not an answer. How many of you have ever told your kids, I don't know is not an answer? <laughs> I don't know is not an answer. Why? Tell me why. And this goes back and forth for a bit. I don't know. No, that's not an answer. You need to know. Think about it. Tell me why. And so there's this awkward, long kind of pause. And then from the back seat, I hear this very sincere, very shameful voice emerge from the silence. Daddy, she smelled like strawberries. And I thought she would taste good. <laughs> that was the answer to that why question. Was not the answer I thought I was going to get. Sometimes when you ask a why question, you, you get an answer you might not be expecting. Today we're going to look at a why question that Jesus asked, and I believe he's still asking of us today. It's a hard question, it's a why question. And I suspect if we took time today to go up and down the rows and to have everyone honestly and humbly answer this question, we would probably all have different answers to the question. We would have at least different variations and flavors of our answer. The question he asked comes from Luke chapter 6, verse 46. If you have your Bibles, you'll want to open there for this morning. And it is this, why... Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And that's a good question in and of itself, but that's not the thrust of the question. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? That's a really good question, isn't it? Have you ever thought about that question? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? A couple of obvious things about this. This question is for believers. This question is for disciples. This question is for those of us who have repented and given our life to Jesus. We've called and confessed and claimed him as our Lord and Savior. It's the basis of the question, why do you call me Lord but, but don't obey me? Why do you call me Lord but don't do what I say? Let's read it in its full context Starting in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts on them. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood came and the river crashed against that house and couldn't shake it because it was well built, but the one who hears and does not act is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The river crashed against it, and immediately it collapsed, and the destruction of that house was great. Matthew records his version of this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 27, and he adds some other details. He has a slightly different perspective than Luke does on some of the details of the matter. But essentially, the same question emerges in Matthew's account as well. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? And in both Luke and Matthew, this person's house, which represents this person's life, is being built on one of two foundations, either a solid foundation 
or a poor foundation. And in the text, Jesus offers a few common or general reasons why we do this, why we would call him Lord, Lord, and not obey his commands. We're going to run through those very quickly because the truth is there are thousands, tens of thousands of answers to this why question. But in general, some of the things Jesus mentions here are things like the first one. It's first blank in your bulletin. Uh, it's the word toil. Toil is one of the reasons why people call him Lord, Lord, and don't do the things he says. It's hard to live as a disciple. It's hard to obey. It's hard, as the text says, to, to dig deep and to put in the work to lay a solid foundation. Following Jesus and living for Jesus is hard. He described it in other places in the Gospels as the narrow way that leads to the narrow gate, and few find it because it's difficult. In fact, in Matthew chapter 7, right before this discussion, Jesus talks about that very thing. It's hard. That's why. The second reason many call him Lord but don't do the things he says can be summed up with the word time. It takes time to dig deep. It takes time to study the Word of God. It takes time to apply the Word of God. It takes time to, to build on the rock and to lay a solid foundation. And we live in a world where nobody has enough time. We live in a world where everybody is short on time. Or more accurately said, we live in a world where everybody just wants it right now and doesn't want to put in the time. We want it fast. We want it now. We want to see it. We want to touch it. We want to taste it. We want to have it. We want to experience it now. We don't want to put in the time to dig deep. The third word could be the word thinking. We have poor thinking, which is one of the reasons why people call him Lord, Lord, but they don't do the things he says. They think poorly. We think we'll get away with it, for example. We think we will be the exception to the rule. We're the one person who doesn't have to obey that command for whatever reason. We think it doesn't matter that much, that it's just a little thing or a little deal. We think nobody's going to notice and nobody's going to care. We think we'll get around to it later in life. We think because everybody else is doing it, it must be okay. The bottom line is our poor thinking oftentimes produces some kind of justification in our life that if we follow that line of thinking and that justification leads us to a very poor foundation and ultimately to failure. The fourth word would be the word trust. There's a real lack of trust in our world. We don't trust our politicians. We don't trust our neighbors. Some of us don't even trust the people we live with. We don't trust our bosses. We don't trust our employees. You sure better not trust the people driving down the interstate with you, going 85, swerving in and out of all the lanes. Everywhere we look, everything we do, every, every, every part of our life, we're surrounded by things we, we know we can't and we shouldn't trust because we live in a world filled with sin. And what happens is, is that bleeds over into our faith and because we grow to believe we can't trust anyone or anything, we can even get to a place where we don't trust God. That's probably a big part of the answer, why we call him Lord, Lord, and don't do the things he says. We just don't trust God enough to obey God. The fifth one is what I call tricky temptations. Sometimes we just give in to whatever that temptation happens to be. Again, because we want to taste it, we want to have it, we want to experience it. And, and church, we have an enemy, we know this, we have an enemy, the devil, who wants to destroy us, and many times he will use these tricky, sometimes even just very obvious temptations to pull us into disobedience, and, and we, get this, we get this urge to do something we shouldn't do, just like my child thought, well, she... She smells like strawberries, so she'll probably taste like strawberries too. And we go and do something extremely foolish. 
There are thousands of answers to this question, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? So we're not going to take time today to try to go through all of them. But what I do want us to do is I want us to look at this text, and I want to try to understand it and understand where Jesus is coming from. And my prayer is this, my prayer is that you and I and all of us would do better this week. And we'd do better this month, and we would do better this year. My prayer is we'll do better for the rest of our lives at obeying Jesus. Here's what I think it really comes down to. It's a basic lesson in life that we've all had to learn at some point in time. It's our big idea for today. It's Jesus' big idea in the passage. Have you ever heard this? Saying it and doing it are two different things. Yeah, y'all have heard that? That's the big idea for today. That's the big idea that Jesus is getting at here in Luke. How many of you have ever, uh, how many of you when you were growing up, your parents told you that? Raise your hand. The rest of y'all will pray for your parents. I don't know what was wrong with them. They should have told you that. How many of you have ever told your kids that? Saying it and doing it are two different things. Yeah, you better believe it. You better tell your kids that. It's a lesson we all got to learn. Saying it and doing it are two different things. And that's really what Jesus is getting at here in the text. Saying it and doing it are two different things. It's one thing to say, I'm your Lord. It's one thing to say, Lord, Lord. But it's another thing to do what, what, what I ask you to do and to obey me. Three points from this text. The first one is summed up with the word confession. This is where Jesus starts, so it's where we'll start. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? That is the confession of these he's addressing. It's the confession of many of y'all. Jesus is your Lord and your Savior. He says, why do you confess that? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? Why do you confess me as your Lord, but don't obey me? You see, calling Jesus Lord is more than a title. Calling Jesus the Lord of your life is a declaration of his authority over your life. And I think that's the disconnect that most of us are missing. At least some of us, many of us, probably the majority of us have have missed this connection. Lord is not just a title for Jesus. It's not a title like you might call me Pastor Pete or Dr. Pete, where you put a a title before my name. Lord is, is not just his title. When we say he's our Lord, we are declaring that he has absolute authority over our lives. The question Jesus asks is not rooted in a title, it's rooted in his authority. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? He's not saying, you know, why do you give me that title and not do it? He says, why, when you know the authority I have as your Lord, are you not doing the things I'm commanding you and calling you and commissioning you to go and do? Paul proclaimed in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You've heard that one? Say amen if you've heard Romans 10, 9. Praise God. It's a great verse. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now let me ask you this. The confession of your salvation that happens through this in Romans 10, 9, is that based on a title or the authority of Jesus? Authority. It is his authority to forgive your sins that makes that a reality. It is his authority to save you that makes that a reality. It's not a title that saves you. It's the authority of Christ. And he has authority over everything. He has authority over death. You can read Revelation 1, 18. He has authority over sin, Mark chapter 2, verse 10. He has authority over the devil and demons, Mark chapter 1, verse 27. He has authority over creation, Colossians 1, 16. He has authority over the angels, 1 Peter 3, 22. We could go on and on and on, but the bottom line is he has authority over everything, as is presented in Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 20, where it says he exercised this power in Christ 
by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. When you read stuff like that, you see the kind of authority we're talking about. It's not a title. Lord is not just a title. It's his authority. When you read Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, I hope you don't just see that, that word there and those things there as, as his title. The authority of Jesus is on display In Philippians 2, verse 10, it says, So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Church, every knee doesn't bow, and every tongue doesn't confess because he has a title, Lord. Every knee bows, every tongue confesses, because everyone will recognize the authority of Christ. And at that recognition, they will hit their knees, and they will confess with their tongues that he is Lord. Not to placate him, not to, not, not to just say, here's a title. It's a way to say, I see your authority He's the only one who has the authority to forgive sins and give us eternal life. He said that in John chapter 10, starting in verse 28, among other places. He says, I, this is Jesus, I give them eternal life. He's the one who has authority. And they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who's given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. I'm the authority, is what he's saying. This is why Jesus asked the question, why do you call me Lord, Lord, recognizing my authority, but then you don't do the things I say? You see, our confession, our repentance, our salvation is made possible only by the authority of Jesus. So if we as the church, the ecclesia, have confessed, have repented, have believed, have called on him as Lord, and then we don't obey him as Lord, that's a big problem in the eyes of our Lord. See, saying it and doing it are two different things. It's why he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? The next word, point number two, is the word commitment. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? Likely because there's a lack of commitment. Following Jesus is not just about a confession It's also about a lifelong commitment to the process of sanctification in your life as a disciple. And if we fall into that category of those who call on him as Lord, but don't do the things he says, it's probably because we are not committed to him as our Lord. If if we want to not fall into that category, we have to be fully committed followers of Jesus. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commands. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 and 25, it says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me, will find it. That, to me, sounds like a life that's going to require some commitment, don't you think? In Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, he said, Rather, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. 
That takes commitment. It's hard. It will require us to be like the person Jesus talked about in our passage. It won't be easy. It won't be fast. It won't be cheap. But it is the right way to live. Do you remember what he said in our passage? Go back here in Luke chapter 6. Start with me in verse 48. He says, He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood came and the river crashed against that house, it couldn't shake it because it was well built. That took commitment. Digging deep, putting it on the rock, laying a firm foundation. I can promise you it wasn't the fastest way it could have been done. It wasn't the easiest way it could have been done. It wasn't the cheapest way it could have been done. But it was the best way to get it done. But it required great commitment upon the builder. Church, let me remind you of this also, because I can see, I can see y'all's faces, because I have my glasses on. Um, I can see some of y'all like, man, I'm, I'm a total doofus. I'm a big failure. Gosh, you're right. Can I, can I encourage you real quick? You're not the first to struggle with this. You're not the first to fail. You're not the first to fall short. We, we're not the first people to call him Lord and not do what he says. We're not the first to cut a corner to try to do something a little faster and a little easier and a little cheaper and not obey in the process. John wrote to the early church in 1 John, and, and we could read something from probably every epistle Paul wrote because they were struggling with this too. But 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, just as one example, he writes this. He says, this is how we know that we know him if we keep his commands. That's what we're talking about today. He says, the one who says, I have come to know him and yet doesn't keep his commands is a liar and the truth is not in, in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly in him, the love of God is made complete. This is how we know that we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. Why is he writing those words? Because they were having trouble with this too. This struggle has been going on for a long time, church. Now that is not an excuse or a reason for us not to try. It's not a reason or an excuse for, for us just to say, well, it's always been this way, and so I guess Jesus is just going to have to forgive me again. But you know what it is? It's a reminder of God's grace and God's mercy and his love for us. It's a gift of hope. A gift of hope that says, if you're like me and you're struggling, if you're like me and you're one of those struggling saints who's, who's trying to get it right, who's trying to do it but still falls short, there's a gift of hope here. Because even when we fall short on our commitments, and even when we fall short on obeying his commands, you know what? He's still faithful. It's, it's, it's a gift of hope to say don't stop and don't quit and don't get frustrated and don't just say I can't do this and it can't be done. It, it, it's a calling, it's a beckoning to come back and be committed to Jesus to obey his commands and his ways and do better today than you did yesterday. We need to be sure that we're not the first to struggle with this, but we need to also be sure that we're not okay lingering in our struggle, that we want to get better. We need to be sure that we're not just saying we're committed to Jesus and calling him Lord and that we're committed to the kingdom, but we're not doing the things of the kingdom and the things our Lord is calling us to. We need to actually do it because saying it and doing it are two different things. So my encouragement is be committed and be ready to answer the question, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? We'll close with this one, point number three. It's the word consequences. If you've tuned me out so far, or been busy on your phone, or been distracted by the devil in some other way, I, I hope you'll come back. I want to encourage you here for the last few minutes to tune back in, because this last part is super, super important. We all need to see that there are consequences attached to this question. When Jesus asks us a question, we should pay attention to it and we should consider it. 
we would be wiser still to answer it as honestly and sincerely and humbly as we can. Hear these words again, these words of Jesus. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts on them. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when the flood came, the river crashed against that house and couldn't shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears and does not act, the one who hears and does not act is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The river crashed against it and immediately it collapsed. And the destruction of that house was great. Let that sink in a minute. And the destruction of that house was great. House here is being used to represent the life of a person. He's saying the destruction of that life was great. If you read this in the Greek, the Greek word here for destruction means to be totally annihilated. It means to collapse in on itself. It literally means to be ruined beyond repair. It means it can't be rebuilt. It can't be patched up. We're not talking about a storm that came through and blew the roof off and you just put a new roof on the house. We're not talking about some floodwaters that came in and you just went in and cut the sheetrock out at about waist level and put the sheetrock back in and you were good to go. We're not, we're not talking about a storm that just knocked a tree over onto your garage and all you had to do was patch that up and it looks just like new. When he says the destruction was great, he means it was destroyed to the point it could never be repaired. The entire house or the entire life was destroyed. And notice again, the key here is the action that was taken. The only difference between these two houses or these two lives is is one acted on what they were told and the other did not. One acted on the words and the ways and the commands of Jesus and the other didn't act. You see, what we do with whatever we hear matters. What we do with what we read in God's word matters. What we do with what we know in our hearts to be true and right because the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, it matters. What we do matters. Saying it and doing it, saying it and acting on it, those are two different things. We can't just be the people who say it. We have to be the people who do it. Where we choose to build and what foundation we build on matters. There's no foundation outside of Jesus that will last. There is no foundation outside that foundation of Christ that will last. There is no foundation outside of or that can be substituted for the foundation of Jesus. You can try to build on anything you want. I promise you it will not last unless it's Jesus. Building on anything else, building on anything less, building on anything other than the foundation which is Christ will lead to sudden, absolute, total, devastating, unrepairable destruction. Paul proclaimed to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 3.11, he said, for no one can lay any foundation other than that which has been laid down. And he said that foundation is Jesus Christ. Christ, period. In Romans 10, starting in verse 8, it says, On the contrary, what does it say? This message is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. This is the message of faith that we proclaim, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame, since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
not confessing, not repenting, not believing has eternal consequences. If you don't know him, I pray that this day, this hour might be the day that you open your heart and your mind to consider who Christ is and what he did and whether or not the foundation you're building on is going to last. If you do know him, if you have repented, if you have confessed, if you are the church, if your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, I rejoice with you, I celebrate with you. But for you and for me, I pray that we might consider this day if we're living our lives fully committed to the confession which we have professed. Or if we need to answer the question, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? Because saying it and doing it are two completely different things. For those of you here who do know Jesus, who have called on him, I have a challenge for you today. There's one last blank there at the bottom of your bulletin. And this is a blank I don't have the answer for. It's a blank you have to fill in yourself. It says, I will obey and, and then there's a blank. What do you need to do? What do you need to do this week? What do you need to do today? What do you need to do? What needs to go in that blank? I'm I'm sure something comes to your mind that you could do a little better. Some command that he's called you to that you haven't done yet. Something you've been putting off something that you've been justifying or making excuses for, what do you need to do? I can't fill that blank in for you. I can only fill it in for me. And let me just tell you, I took up the whole blank and some more. I'm certain we all have something we need to do. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? It might be forgiving somebody. It might be being faithful to tithe here at the church. It might be reading and studying God's word faithfully and being in the Bible every day. It might be spending more time in prayer. It might be asking for forgiveness from your spouse. I don't know what it is. It could be a thousand things. But whatever it is, I want you to write it down and then I pray you will act on it this week. I pray you'll go do it. I pray you'll do the things Jesus says because saying it and doing it are two different things. For those of you who are here today and can hear my voice and you are not saved, your name has not been written in the Lamb's book of life, you've never repented, you've never confessed, you've never believed in Jesus as your Lord, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to listen to and for his voice. I want to challenge you to allow his Holy Spirit to wash over you for the next few moments. And if you feel the Holy Spirit's presence in your life and surrounding you and calling your name and you desire to know his grace and love and mercy and to be forgiven, if you desire to know the joy of the hope of salvation which can only be found in Jesus, then I pray you will obey today. I pray you will confess and repent and believe and be saved this hour. Let's pray. If that's you and you've never given your life to the Lord, we're not going to ask you to raise your hand or come to the front this morning. We're just going to ask you to do business with God. If you indeed sense the Holy Spirit in this place calling your name and desire to know him, I pray you would confess and believe by following me in this short prayer in the stillness of your heart. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed up and gone astray, so I ask now by faith that you would change me. Lord, I ask by faith you would forgive me and make me new. Lord, I thank you for your grace, for your love, for your mercy. I thank you for dying on the cross for me. And today I confess you as Lord. I give you authority and dominion over my life. And pray that you would help me to do the things that you say.
Father, as we close this hour, we rejoice with those who have just prayed that prayer. And Father, I rejoice with my brothers and sisters who have done that some time ago. And though not perfect, Father, are people who long for you, who care about the things of your kingdom. Father, I pray that you would help them this week. Help me this week, Lord, not to just be someone who says it, but to be someone who does it. Father, help us to stand on nothing other than the Word of God and the Son of God, who is the foundation for our lives. Lord, as I've been reflecting in my prayer time this week, you have continually blessed me with the reminder of that wonderful hymn that we have sung so many times. Those beautiful words that say, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Father, there is much sinking sand in our world. Help us to dig deep, to stand on the rock, to follow and fully obey you, our Lord. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for being a part of our online family and joining us for this message that God put on my heart. I pray that it blesses you. I want to ask you if you could just do three quick, simple, easy, free things for me right away. If you haven't already, number one, hit the subscribe button. Number two, hit the thumbs up or like button if you feel like this video, this sermon is worthy of that. And number three, if God blesses your heart with this message, leave an encouraging word. Just leave an encouraging comment or a thought down there in the comment section. We would appreciate that so much. Thank you for being a part of our family, for joining us uh, here for this message.